Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki jai nama om Vishnu padaya Krishna prasnaya bhutale Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami ti namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Asyatya De Sitarine Srila Prabhupada ki jai His Grace Janaki Nath Prabhu ki jai So um, my meeting with this very unique and very interesting soul and we might all add from my experience a very special person who started around the year 2009 I believe or maybe even earlier 2008 uh, my frequent visits to the UK particularly London Bhakti Vedanta Manor required me to travel around the city and do programs and there was always a need to have a driver so one time when there was no driver available I requested the temple to find me a driver and uh, they sent this young man who I had never met before and he pulled up in this big white van which was the temple van and he offered to take me around and so he did and that was the beginning of our uh, association together somehow we developed a relationship based on that that service he was doing and he continued to do it at different times when i was there at that particular occasion but then uh, i guess just by the arrangement of the of the lord we started to speak more and more and i found out more about him his interest in krishna consciousness but at the same time he was not really practicing in a regular way so i offered to give a little bit of advice and guidance and uh, try to bring him more into a regulated uh, activity of devotional service So he was very responsive to that. And I liked his nature because he was always his nature was he was always eager to serve. And that's one thing I always saw throughout our relationship that he had this very strong and sometimes even very passionate uh desire to serve and it would be exhibited in that way that he would think of ways to serve. Sometimes of course he would make mistakes because it's It's not always easy to understand how to do service on a personal level, but his enthusiasm and his his uh, determination to try to serve in the best possible way was always uh, one of his outstanding qualities. So at one point, of course, then I started to and we developed a relationship. So I thought him. I saw he wasn't married. He was a young man. He had some abilities. So he was starting to ask advice on how he could best practice Krishna consciousness. Uh he wasn't inclined, but I thought the best thing for him was to join the ashram and uh, take part with the brahmacharis there. Um he wasn't so inclined to that. He thought he could practice outside, but I could see that maybe some training, some guidance would uh, you know really focus his consciousness on krishna con- on on the process of devotional service nicely so i was quite persistent that this is the best avenue he should pursue finally he agreed to it and i said stay in the ashram for 2 years and see how you do he he gave it a try and then he of course he went way beyond 2 years he he liked it so much he found that this was his a uh, way to serve being in a brahmachari ashram he developed many relationships with many of the brahmacharis and uh he started to flourish and take on more services but although he was in the brahmachari ashram he would uh he was mostly seen as a person who could who would do personal service any time i came to uh london so based on that we were traveling together and part of my service also was to go to america during the summer time so i think it was in the year 
16, or maybe even before then, yeah, it was actually even before then, that he would take trips with me to the U.S. and we would stay there sometimes five weeks, sometimes eight weeks. One time we stayed for three months, that was in the year 2016. So we developed a relationship because I could see he was intelligent, enthusiastic, and uh, his nature was always like, I could see him how he interacted with other people. Um, and this was something that was brought out by other people themselves. They would even express it, that he is so naturally and easily approachable. He had no false ego, no airs about him. You could talk to him, you could speak to him in any, you could, you know, the, he, he was there to be, to be, to interact with you at any time and in any place and with any type of people. He had a certain quality that he could, some people called it affable, which means easily approachable, easily talk, you can easily talk to him. And uh, there was no airs about him. After some time, I would hear how the devotees in the ashram were really appreciating his presence there. And they were making statements like, and these were coming from the leaders who were managing the ashrams, that this boy is non-envious. He has, doesn't have a, a, a spark of envy in him. Um, it was, became easy for me to see that once it was pointed out, but before then, I didn't see it. I never thought he was envious, but I, didn't see, I couldn't see his complete non-enviousness. But then it, it was obvious how he treated people, how he treated people was he was always taking a personal interest in them. And somehow or other, he would always make them feel happy, make them feel appreciated. He was, he was like everybody's friend immediately. <laughs> And uh, especially in America, when we were traveling, going into and in and out of airports, going in and out of homes, staying in different places, traveling around, how he would just speak to people, just, just meeting them for the first time, and carry on a conversation. <laughs> he didn't need an introduction to, to talk to people. And I found that very helpful because we were able to preach nicely. And he would talk to people and just ask them about their Krishna consciousness, encourage them to take a... He had a card for an app where you could use that app. And on that, in that app, it takes you into the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So he was making many people Krishna conscious simply by meeting them. When we would travel, strangers, devotees, other people. It's just interesting. And... Uh, he had many talents too. He would like to do mas magic tricks with cards. He had mastered that. He did it in such a way that he would entertain people in a Krishna conscious way. He would always tell me how he used it on Sankirtan to attract people's attention so he could get them to hear about Srila Prabhupada's books and then eventually sell the books. And the devotees noted that he had that ability, so one of the services that was given to him during that time was to go out on book distribution. So he became a regular on the Christmas marathons in the Bhaktivedanta Manor. And he was always up towards the top of the list of the book distributors at the end of the marathon. Sometimes he would dis distribute over 100 Bhagavad Gita's in one day. And that would carry on for not just one day, but many days in a row. Um, I think one year he came in second in the marathon. I mean, there's big competition. You had, an, uh, I forgot his name, Ananda something. He was, uh, he was, he was the best book distributor in the entire, uh, entire uh, UK. Ananda Chaitanya, who eventually left and went to went to uh, Hungary to associate with his devotee. And so uh, he, uh, yeah, and so he, they became close friends. And then he would always talk about Ananda and glorify Ananda and they would 
shared her Krishna consciousness together. So he made friends with a lot of devotees in a very meaningful way. Devotees that were later on became great preachers or even during that time. Um, but one of the things that he wanted to do, aside from his book distribution during the marathons, he wanted to continue doing personal service to me. And it was the need was there. But then I saw that there this boy has, this, this particular devotee has the qualities that he could really make a difference in preaching Krishna consciousness. And so I was encouraging him to take part in more, more of the temple activities evolved around preaching. And so reluctantly he did it because he, was, he would prefer to be, you know, a personal servant. And that was good for me, but it wasn't good for him because I could see this boy had potential. There's a story of Prabhupada also did that with Hari Kesh, who later became Hari Kesh Maharaj. When he was serving Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada sent him to Europe to open up Europe, and he did. But he wanted to stay with Prabhupada and remain Prabhupada's assistant and servant. I think he was Prabhupada's secretary, or maybe personal, not personal servant, but secretary. And Prabhupada said, no, I saw something in him. He could, he could do wonders in preaching, but he didn't want to leave me, as Prabhupada was saying. And that was the same with Janaki Nath. He didn't want to leave that service, but... And then when he finally surrendered, he started to come up with creative ideas on how to preach. He became involved with the College of Vedic Studies and Uncommon Sense. He was doing pro programs and, and with other devotees. And he was really making a lot of people Krishna conscious. Uh, he knew the philosophy and how he explained the philosophy was unique to his character. There was one time when we were uh, traveling in the U.S. We were going from Detroit to Boston. And we took an early morning flight to reach Boston because that day at uh, one o'clock there was, well, there was a Rathiyatra scheduled. So we had arrived, I think, sometime around 10 o'clock in the morning so I got ready to t attend the Rathiyatra. So when I got there today, they requested me to lead the kirtan in the Rathiyatra. And so I did. And uh, it lasted for about two, two and a half hours. And I led the whole thing all the way. And then when I was done, after traveling that morning, preaching the night before, doing that, they said, well, now it was Sunday also. So you have the Sunday feast, Maharaj. <laughs> and I said, I can't do it. <laughs> I need a break. You know, I was wanted a little bit of your time, you know, just to, and I thought, well, Janaki Nas here, let him do it. And so I approached him and he was completely reluctant. He didn't want to do it. He kept pushing it back towards me. But I said, no, I think you can do it, and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so it was a Sunday feast at the Boston Temple. So he, reluctantly, in his humble way, he accepted the service. And so he, he gave the lecture. And I decided I was going to listen to the lecture, but not, not let anybody know I was listening. So I found a place where I could listen and not be seen. And so I did. And then I was hearing that the whole class was like, you know, roaring with laughter and, <laughs> and he was keeping everybody happy and it was interesting. And he was also preaching in an interesting way. And this was the first time anybody in that area really got to know him. And they, they didn't expect that. So at the end of the class, the temple president was also in the class and he came up to me and said, Oh, that, that devotee is interesting. He gave a, gave a really interesting class. This was in, it was really not only interesting, but it was a lot of fun, too. <laughs> so from that, that gave me a, a greater understanding of what he could do. And then 
from then on, I was pushing him to take more responsibility in giving classes. So those we were traveling together, I would look for opportunities to allow him to give the class. And then he became more inclined to that, so he did. And people would always praise his classes because he did his classes in an, in an interactive way. He would never just speak and then devotees would listen. He would present a, the subject matter in an interesting way and then ask questions and ask the devotees to respond to his questions. And then he would take the answers and just keep it moving on the philosophy. It was really, really unique and interesting how he gave classes. He always engaged people in the audience, in the discussions. And of course, we also know that's very effective and, and as a learning principle. So he was good at that. And then he, did, he started to do that a lot. And then of course, when he came back to London, he was always involved uh, with preaching with the ashram, with the devotees like that. When he got sick in the end of 2016, and then the beginning of 2017, he started to have some stomach cramps, and then after tests, they found it was he had some little bit of cancer in the colon, so it was decided he'd go through an operation. And so that was in February of 2017. So he he underwent the operation in a very what we say joyful way, you might say. It wasn't like oh, I'm suffering. He took it as, okay, I have to go through this, like that. And he did. And uh, while he was in the hospital, before and after the operation, <clears throat> he was always interested in trying to preach to the fellow patients. Even the nurses would say, this was after his operation. They would come looking for him in his bed, and they couldn't find him. Because he'd be out walking around giving books to, to some of the some of the patients. So he made friends, and I remember one time when I went to see him right after his operation, he started to introduce me to some of the people that he met, and because he had developed a personal relationship with them. And he learned about them, and they would tell him, tell him what they were like and what they were experiencing. And then he would, uh, so he would introduce me to them, and then you know, I got to know them also. <laughs> so it was, uh, how he did that was just so natural. It wasn't something that he was like putting on, it was just his personality. He was very friendly, open, but he was concerned about people. And you could see that on how he dealt with people. He was always concerned. Sometimes he would be jolly and sometimes he'd be very serious. You know, he had different moods like that. Most of the time he was happy. He was always happy. Uh, he liked to serve. It was more like his nature to serve. You didn't really have to push him to serve. Sometimes you had to correct him in how to serve. There was one incident we were, again, in Detroit. And this was in a different year. We had to travel from Detroit to Hartford, Connecticut. And we had a flight, and I had been doing programs in, for about three or four days every evening, and I was getting really, really tired. <laughs> so the next morning we had a flight to go. So he was managing all the you know logistics. That was one of the services that he was really good at. He could contact people. He could arrange for getting us drivers. He could arrange for programs. He would arrange for tickets, for travel. He would do all these services. So I asked him, I said, what time is our flight? And he said, well, it's 11 minutes after 9 in the morning. And I was thinking, that doesn't sound right. Because they don't make flights odd numbers like that. It's always on the 5, you know, 5 after 10, after 15. It's never like odd, like 9, 11. So, I thought about it, and then I asked him again a little later in that same morning, and he came back with the same answer. So I just accepted it. 
So when we got to the airport, the flight was gone <laughs> because he gave the arrival time and not the departure time. So 9-11 was the arrival time. <laughs> so, and uh, another devotee was with us, Shiv Datani, so the three of us, we had no flight. And then that was Sunday also, and I had to do a Sunday afternoon program at three o'clock and again in the evening with the regular Sunday program. So we asked, is there any other flights? They said, well, there's one more flight, but it's full. It's coming up in about an hour or so, but there's no room. But then they came back and said, well, we actually found one seat, so we have one open seat. So the devotee said, well, you go, Maharaj, you have to give the classes. So I said, fine. So the other two, Shiv and Chaniki Nath, they went standby also. So I was on the flight, and just before it took off, both of them came onto the flight. Somehow they got on. So we were together, but it was a connector. It wasn't a direct flight, like our original flight. So we flew to another city. I forgot where we went. And when we landed, we had to wait, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours for the next flight to take us to Hartford. And uh, during that time, we met so many people who were also, you know, transiting. And Johnny Kinath was distributing books to the people and meeting people. People were coming up to us and asking us who we are. And some people would sit down next to us and ask questions. It was interesting. So many opportunities to meet people and distribute books happened during that that interim period when we were connecting. And then on the flight too, we met people. We got there, I got there just in time for my afternoon session, just made it. That means we had a, we, we missed lunch because we were supposed to get there in lunchtime and then. So I said, forget lunch, we'll just do it, we'll do the program. So we did the program and then uh, we did that program, we did the Sunday Feast program. We finally had lunch about nine o'clock in the evening. But the whole day was completely successful in terms of how many opportunities we had to distribute books, to meet people. So I was thinking his apparent mistake was actually good because it gave us greater opportunities to meet people and, and preach. I don't think we would have had that if everything was the way it would have way it should have been. So it's an indication that, you know, his mistakes actually turned into, you know, apparent mistake turned into something wonderful. And that was Johnny Kina. Um, my, I guess my fondest memories are with when we were uh, traveling in the U.S. There were so many opportunities to, to meet people, how he would bring people in, how he could talk to people, how he could create situations which would help the preaching. It's just so much. When we were together in London, mostly, you know, he would come to where I was and sometimes do personal service. And he was good at it. But most of the time when I was here, at, that, at these later dates, he was always in the ashram, you know, doing service with the ashram like that. And I didn't have much exposure. Just recently, I think it was last week, we had a program to honor Johnny Kinath, I think it was last Friday. And devotees who I didn't even know, who knew him, who had uh, many, many, you know, as much association with him in different ways were glorifying how he was, how they loved him, how they would benefited from him, how they made friends with him, people I never knew. And he never talked about what he did. He never wanted to present himself as like I'm preaching and this is... Sometimes I would ask him and he would tell me, 
well, I have this program, I have that program, I have this program, like that. But he would never get into details. He was always very much a disciple when he was with me, but when he was away, he was like an amazing preacher. Yeah. And he just, but more than his preaching was the way he dealt with people. And it wasn't like he planned to deal with people the way he did. It was just the way he was. It was his personality. <laughs> he was so friendly, open, caring, could be humorous, could be serious. He was, it was, he was just natural. And sometimes I would have to, you know, push him to do, you know, you're getting your rounds done, you're reading, and he would, he would be more interested in doing service and spending time with devotees and preaching. So I had to kind of like emphasize that. But then later on, of course this one when he was getting sick, he developed a strong attachment for the philosophy. And he was reading Chaitanya Charitamrita and, and preaching it to people he was meeting. He developed a real attraction for the books. And he developed a nice library and he was just, he was reading all the time. He loved to read. He just loved to read. And then his knowledge of the philosophy really expanded even more so. And then our time together was a lot less because he was always doing more, more time with his treatments. And then uh, when I would come to the UK, he would come and see me. But the thing that I always noted about my own reaction is that every time I saw him or else he came to see me, I would feel happy. I didn't have to feel happy by trying to be happy. It was just by being with him. It was this happiness that he he, had, he carried around with his personality that made other people happy. And that was an experience I had. When he came, I was happy. <laughs> of course, I had to do my service in relationship to him, so I, there was times I had to correct him and do other services. But I always loved to be with him. <laughs> it was just a pleasure for me. He was more than a disciple, he was more like a friend also. Um, there are many, of course, how he wanted to help people who had cancer. He understood being experiencing his own situation with cancer. He felt really, really concerned about other people who had cancer, so he made an effort. And we all know what he did. He arranged for 35 people from the hospital, a few, couple doctors, some nurses, and mostly all cancer patients, to come to Bhaktivedanta Manor and they have a wonderful experience meeting devotees, going to bhajans, hearing classes, playing games. He was always into these other kind of side activities. When we, I used to do a disciple meeting every uh, every April. So the last one I did was in 2019, before we got this lockdown. And when we were organizing, it was right during um, uh, Lord Ram's appearance. In fact, one of the days fell on Lord Ram's appearance day. That was in, and we did it in Buckland Hall. And he made a whole series of like ways to bring the devotees together in a very friendly but very devotional way, coming up with these little games, which were Krishna conscious games. And at first I didn't really go for it. I thought we'd spend more time with kirtans and classes. But he said, no, this is really good. This will bring the devotees together and that's, that's what we really want. So I, I said, fine, you organize it and we'll, we'll put it in the schedule. And so he did. And the devotees loved it. It's on film. You can see the devotees have a wonderful time. But it's all connected to Krishna consciousness. 
It wasn't just games for the sake of games. It was, it was a learning experience for all the boys. But it kind of brought, because people remember each other now who didn't know each other so well through that experience. You know, they would always talk about how nice it was when he organized these different programs at Buckland Hall. It's nice. So he was good at bringing people together in a very Krishna conscious way, or at least a friendly way. Yeah. I, never, he, I never heard him speak bad about anybody. Sometimes I would ask him about different situations with different people, and he would tell me, but he would never speak in a very negative or derogatory or critical way about the people. Mm. He never criticized. And nor did I ever hear anybody criticize him. I didn't find anybody who really had any negativity towards him. It was interesting. He had a very sweet nature, very sweet. But he would cover that sweet nature by his enthusiasm to serve, like that. Very sweet. So, uh, he's a, he was actually a very great soul. When Radha Damodar Prabhu wrote to Shiva Ram Maharaj about Janaki Nath and his disappearance, Shiva Ram Maharaj really said some really powerful things. And one of the things he said, I, it's obvious that this person came and he only had a little bit of karma left and he finished it up. And, and now he went back to Krishna. Yeah, he wrote that. Because he left after, he was only 36 years old when he disappeared. My experiences during the ceremonies that we did in order to, you know, in honor of the departed soul were just so sweet. It wasn't like, there was some sadness that he was no longer there and devotees felt it. But mixed in with that sadness, there was this, this element of joyfulness that was in the atmosphere. His parents also told me, they actually said, we don't feel like this is something sad. We feel like this is a wedding. That's an exact statement. That's what they said. And later on, of course, they learned so much about their son, which they didn't know which really made them really appreciate him more than just a son, but a, a person who was really loved by so many people. Because he doesn't, he never talked about what he did to others, unless you asked him, you know, generally. He would always be very shy in that area, never presented himself as being, you know, anybody personal, but anybody important. That was his nature. But one thing he did, which was really wonderful, and that was he spent really quality time with his family just before he left. And that was needed. I get it, Krishna arranged for him to spend that time. And they were serving him. They were with him. They really, and this, this went on for many, many, many months. So, because of that, in one sense, it was good because they didn't regret that, well, you know, he's gone. He gave them a lot before he left. And they really, really appreciated that. They appreciated it after knowing, after knowing when he left. So. His family, and I've been to the house twice since he's disappeared. They are becoming more Krishna conscious. Just because of hearing about him, learning what a wonderful person he was, although he was so close to them, on the family level, they started to really understand that, yeah, Krishna consciousness is something wonderful. So they're becoming more and more connected, you might say.
There are many other things we could mention. How, when we had that ceremony just before we went to the crematorium, how the kirtans were so joyful. The devotees were dancing. <laughs> And his body was there, devotees were coming out, offering flowers, offering prayers. And then I had the service of offering these sacred articles. This is interesting. I don't know how it happened, it's just amazing, but many temples in India, on the request of the devotees in India, I think it was Goranga and a few other devotees from uh, Govardhan Echo Village, had contacted some of these temples and asked if they could offer some article. And we, we accumulated like Radharani's personal uh, jewelry. We got Krishna's dhoti, uh, other clothes from deities, some decorations that they used for the deities, mukuts and other things. And then there was one part of that ceremony at the, at, the, at the temple, in front of the temple, where I was to place these articles on the body. And I did. And for me, it was just a wonderful experience. Now, when I was looking at him, laying there, I was thinking, he looks happy. It was. Although he was there, I could see something. Of course, he's, the soul is gone, but in his, in his physical form, there was something very wonderful. It was almost like he was smiling <laughs> during that. I noted it. I noted it so much that I, I even made. I even told the other devotees, he looks like he's smiling. <laughs> and you know, I never felt sad during this whole situation, I felt something wonderful happened, that he actually attained the perfection of life and went back to the spiritual world. Even if I tried to, you know, go deep into the mood of, you know, mourning, I couldn't do it. I would always think of him, of him in, a, in a very happy way, even after he left. There was something wonderful about his departure. And there's, there's an interesting story related to that. One of his god sisters, she's also a very, very wonderful devotee. She, spend, she used to spend every year at Govardhan, Govardhan Hill. She would do Govardhan Parikram every, every day, practically, when she was there. And she would live at Radhakund, right near the Radhakund. And she made friends with a lot of the Radhakun Babaji's and others. She actually became very well known amongst the devotees at Radhakun. And so she's in Goloka Dam now in Germany and she's doing deity worship there. So she wanted to do something for Janaki Nath after he departed. So she has some friends at, uh, at uh, Radhakun. So she contacted her friends and said, because there is a, they can do a, a ceremony for a departed soul. So she thought that would be nice to do it for Janaki Nath. So, and there would be some pujas, some offerings, some chanting like that. So through her friends, she organized it. And then it was done. And the word got back from her friends that they said, you know, we do this ceremony and these, these Brahmins, they come, and these uh, yogis, they come, and they just come, and they sit through it, and then they, they go. But she said, this time, it was completely different. They were laughing, they were joyful. It was like, she said, I never saw them like that. <laughs> she said, this was unique. The whole atmosphere was different. Usually they just come for the ceremony and then, and, you know, whatever goes on, goes on, and they go. And they just come to honor the ceremony. But this time they were all, she said they were all happy, and you could see it. They were all expressing their happiness outwardly. And uh, 
As she related this story to me, I could understand it was something unique. So Johnny Ginath was not a small person. He, he not only touched the hearts of people he met, but people he didn't even meet. Just by telling people about him, they could understand this is this people, this person is very special. So, you know, you kind of think afterwards, well, wow, such a great soul was in our midst and maybe we didn't fully understand. <laughs> yeah, he was very special. Another God sister of his who does preaching in America. She does interfaith preaching, so she knows like priests and reverends and uh, what we say, people from the, you know, the Jewish tradition, rabbis. So she decided to, sh to show them uh, Johnny Kinnat's talk on TED, when he did TED. The TED Talk, and then he spoke about his situation. So she showed them that video, and uh, they were watching, and when they were watching, they took a real active interest in what he was saying. So some of them took out their notepads and started writing down some of the things he was saying. And then at the end, they said, we want a copy of this, many of them, because what he said is really interesting and useful. We want to use some of the things we could for our preaching also. It's another, so how he touched the hearts of, you know, people who are leaders in other traditions also. Yeah, so you might say, and for our, from our point of view, it was a great loss because he really made a difference and bringing people to Krishna consciousness. And everybody who remembers him, remembers him in a, wonder, in a very fond way. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, we consider ourselves fortunate to have had the association of such a special person. Simple, unpretentious, not presenting himself as anybody special, but just being who he was. <laughs> that was Johnny Kino. Yeah, and I could definitely, with great assurity, say that, you know, his association is greatly missed. <laughs> But we know for sure that he attained, you know, he attained the special mercy of Krishna. Because everyone now, I think about him now, and I see his picture, I always feel a sense of happiness and satisfaction that this boy perfected his life. <laughs> yeah. That's my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Janaki Nath Prabhu Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.